Hello, fellow humans. We need to talk about the elephant in the room. Mainstream media talks about capitalism. It is the obvious, natural state of how the economy is supposed to work. And not just the economy, relationships between all of us are significantly affected by how capitalism is designed to work. But almost no investment advisor, no mainstream TV talking head, questions the definition of capitalism and why does it work like this in the first place. So, what is capitalism? I will give you a pocket definition of capitalism in one simple diagram. Once you understand it, you will have a pretty good idea about what is capitalism and why does it work like this. Here it is. Ownership, power, capital and profit all linked together into a beast that has devoured societies and earth for over 400 years. The connection between these abstract words is what drives the entire economic engine in almost all countries on the planet, with very few distinct exceptions, namely North Korea and Cuba. In my video Top 19 Alternatives to Capitalism, I compared capitalism with an organism. Capital was the body, ownership was the mind, power was the movement. I am adding now motive to represent the purpose of the organism. Let us look at these four spheres one by one. The blue sphere, ownership, is the right given by law and enforced by the state to do something to a thing that is known as property. The thing can be a house, a car, shares in a company, intellectual property, money, legal contracts and many others. Even people were included in this list until slavery was abolished. Capitalism has a very strong internal force that wants to turn everything on earth into property that can be owned privately by humans. That ownership right allows you first to use the thing for example, you have the right to live in the house you own. Second, to benefit from what that thing might produce. For example, you own the patent rights to some pharmaceutical drug, which will earn you payments from anyone else who wants to use your patent. Or you own some farmland and you benefit from what it produces. Third, to sell, modify, change, destroy that thing. For example, you can demolish your house and build a new one with many more rooms. Or you can flip a house for investment and sell it for more money than you spend buying it. These rights are not new to capitalism. They come from Roman law 2000 years ago. Only capitalism constructed this solid organism around them that appears to be impossible to demolish. The arch enemy of capitalism, namely communism, also used the same ownership rights, however it was the state that had them over almost everything that existed in the economy. Factories, means of production, ideas, land. Under capitalism, the humans who have ownership rights are called capitalists or the capitalist class. You cannot do business as a capitalist if you just have ownership of something, but you miss the other parts of the organism. You need all four spheres to be a capitalist. Capitalism understands economic relations between humans and between humans and nature only through possession. The red sphere, capital, represented by the body of the organism, are the things themselves, the property that belongs to its owners. Since capitalism has this unquenchable thirst to turn almost anything into property, it means almost anything can be capital. Any form of money, cash, credit, bitcoin, physical materials, such as those extracted from the earth or those transformed by human labor and ingenuity. Ideas such as the Google search algorithm, the Coca-Cola recipe or the blueprints of an electric car. Land that can be used for agriculture or to build skyscrapers on it. The public image of a celebrity which can be used in commercial advertising or to promote movies or politicians. Rivers, lakes, islands, mountains, mines, caves become capital when they form an organism that behaves like this one. Humans are capital too, 
but not in the sense that they are fully owned by the capitalist class, but in the sense that their labor is an element in the organism. Capitalism needs human labor to keep the organism going. When human labor is scarce or gets sick or is tired or wants higher wages or wants to unionize or needs benefits, capitalism will try to replace it with robots, which are more obedient and more reliable. So then the robots will become capital of a much higher quality or productivity, to use a capitalist word. The green sphere, power, represented by the movement of the system, is everything that the organism does. It's the decisions, the influence, the orders that ruling humans give to other humans to make the organism thrive and expand. Power in practice is how the capitalist corporations and businesses are organized. Organizational charts, corporate culture, mergers, acquisitions, boards of directors, divisions, decisions are all about defining, protecting, expanding power in capitalism. Power itself is very simply the ability to tell other humans what to do, to influence what they think, and to suggest what to believe. The default mode of thinking in capitalism is that the source of power comes from few people at the top of a hierarchy. Power trickles down from the capitalist class all the way to the bottom of the hierarchy, where we have the regular workers who have no power whatsoever, unless, if maybe, they fight to create a union which creates some opposition to the power of the capitalist class. Unions can negotiate wages and benefits, but they do not have the power to topple the hierarchy. Since the beginning of capitalism in the early 1500s, the owners of capital also had the power. The first so-called joint stock company was created in England. It was the company of merchant adventurers to new lands, chartered in 1553 with 250 shareholders. A very famous joint stock company was the East India Company, which was granted a royal charter by Queen Elizabeth I on December 31, 1600. A joint stock company is a business entity in which shares of the company's stock can be bought and sold by shareholders. Each shareholder owns company stock in proportion evidenced by their certificates of ownership. Fast forward to the 21st century, the owners of a company are the humans owning shares. They are at the top of the food chain of power. They select the board of directors, which then creates the pyramid of power with the CEO at the top. Even complicated ownership structures with layers upon layers of one hedge fund owning pieces of a corporation which then owns other pieces of another corporation follows the same diagram. If we unravel this layered onion of ownership and power, we always find individual humans who own millions upon millions of shares in hundreds upon hundreds of corporations. Next, we have the brown sphere, profit which is represented by the motive that drives the entire organism. You can think of it as the instinct the primary emotion, the ultimate purpose. The end goal of any capitalist business is to make profit. In other words, capitalism exists to make more value from less value. This difference is the profit. This difference is the growth of value. But what is value? That is a very loaded question. In a nutshell, capitalism thinks that value is the price of things in the market. The value of a house is the price somebody is willing to pay for it. The same for a Picasso. The value of a company is the price of its shares on the market. The value of an asteroid is the market price of all materials contained in that asteroid. Iron, gold, copper, whatever. Back to growth. No capitalist business can exist without this growth, without profit. This is the fundamental unique feature of capitalism. Some historians claim the origin of the profit motive is the desire of empires to conquer other nations, to expand territory and domination. This might have been an accident of history. We learn from anthropology and archaeology that before capitalism, for thousands of years, humans have thrived in cultures and societies that had no need to expand, 
to conquer, to grow. Only with capitalism, this incredible impulse to make profit has taken over humankind. The profit motive has already become unsustainable and destructive to the existing of humans. The profit motive does not have a limit, a finish line. It must go on forever. However, Earth does not have infinite resources and infinite space. Earth simply does not have enough to feed the hunger of capitalism. We see this happening in front of our eyes, factories shutting down due to lack of parts, price of oil going up due to the decreasing supply and increasing difficulty to extract it, crops losing the yield to feed all humans. We also have the connections between the spheres, the double arrows between ownership, power and capital, and the arrows pushing from profit into all of them. How does this look in practice? The link between ownership and power represents the legal right of shareholders to exercise influence in the corporation they own. If a company has 200 million shares and one human owns 100 million shares, that human has 100 million votes to influence decisions in the corporation. If one human owns all shares of one corporation, he will have 100% of the power in his hands. Everybody else obeys his orders. Only the confines of constitutional democracy prevent that one human from effectively being like a medieval king who could end the life of his subjects on a whim. The link between power and capital represents what the rulers in corporations can do with the capital at their disposal. They decide what is being produced, how much of it, at what price, what salary workers are paid, what factories to shut down, where to open new factories, what private armies to hire to defend their possessions, what to grow on the land they own, and so on. The link between capital and ownership represents possession. It is the idea that humans can appropriate things for the purpose of creating an economic organism with them. Capitalism appropriates lands. This is called colonialism. Capitalism has appropriated people. This is called slavery. Capitalism appropriates the right of smaller nations for self-determination. This is called imperialism. All these have happened and continue to happen because capitalists need to own, need to possess things so they can grow the system. It is a never-ending vicious cycle. At the core, profit pushes into all other three spheres. Profit pushes capitalists to own even more. Profit pushes power to need more power. Profit pushes capital to reproduce itself. Moreover, profit has taken over the imagination of our entire society. Many humans cannot even conceive that another system, another social organism is possible. As I have shown in a previous video, there are many other ways to organize the economy of a society. Let us talk revolutions and change. This is why I make these videos. Imagine what would happen if we broke the links, the double arrows. What if there were no capitalist class? Imagine that the owners of the business are the workers themselves they own all the means of production. They have the power to elect their leadership based on democratic consensus. There is no capital as something that can be extracted, exploited, and wasted. Nature and all resources would be considered carefully as organisms with their own life cycles that need nurture and regeneration. Imagine that we will not have one human with 100 million shares and 100 million votes, but one human, one share, one vote. Ownership, power and capital would not be separate spheres gravitating around each other. All businesses will be one sphere of humans owning together their resources, sharing power, deciding together democratically by consensus what to produce, how to produce, at what price, how much each worker gets paid, how his effort and merit recognized in 
fair and just way, and the limits of earth are not trespassed, and how the well-being of all peoples is properly sustained. Capitalism of 500 years old imperfect and irrational system is full of contradictions. The arrows are the vulnerabilities of capitalism. If we break them, one by one, capitalism will fall. We need to break both the double arrows and the arrows that push out from the profit motive. As Buckminster Fuller, the famous architect, once said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. What is this new model? It is a balance of well-being for all peoples within the limits of Earth. What are the limits of Earth? Here are just a few, each one incredibly important. Keeping global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. Stopping biodiversity degradation. Maintaining the fertility of soil for food production. In the new model, the well-being motive replaces the profit motive. We do not need to grow all the time just for the sake of growing to make positive balance sheets to turn a profit every single year. Humans should strive to live in the green space of prosperity, safety, justice, all below the limits what Earth can provide. We can call this, for example, the well-being economy. It can have many names. The path to the well-being economy is with policies of degrowth, which will seek to build a new model and make the old model capitalism obsolete. In practice, society needs to implement quickly universal basic income, which will immediately increase the well-being of billions of people living in poverty. Universal basic services, such as free healthcare for the entire human body, free education, free public transport, and many more. Worker cooperatives, which are companies owned by the workers. These worker co-ops will make the capitalist class obsolete. Work time reduction. We need to work 20 hours per week not 40 hours per week. A slowing down economy will produce less, consume less, extract less from Earth, and waste less. We need to work less to live more, to have time to update our imagination to a new way of life that is not centered around work for production, but work for pleasure. Maximum income, maximum wealth, and maximum wage gaps. This is about setting limits on greed and consumption. It's about eliminating excess and creating a fair consumption space for all of us. We cannot afford billionaires and multimillionaires with their stupendously wasteful lifestyles. These limits are all about fairness and not overstepping the limits of Earth. New ways to measure the economy, moving away from economic growth to real measures of well-being, such as the genuine progress indicator or the gross national happiness. If there's something you can take away from this video essay, are these two diagrams which represent the obsolete and the future. The faster more people will learn about life centered around well-being, the faster we can get there. Tell your fellow humans about the well-being economy, about the growth, and push your politicians hard to make it happen. And you can make it happen yourself today in the way you work and live your life. Thank you for watching. I put a lot of effort and many hours into making these video essays because I believe we need radical change and I care deeply for the well-being of us all. Please help me spread the word by clicking on the subscribe button below. If you can spare some little money to keep this channel independent, you can donate me a cup of coffee or support me monthly on Patreon at the links in the description. Until next week, be brave, change is coming. Click here to watch this video or this video to learn more.